snacks out our criminal cases prediction so these tasks are usually being done by legal expert which have a lot of experience so we can also formulate this task as a nlp model for example as you can see in the diagram a petitioner is filing complaint for uh, bail grant so here we are using an nlp machine which is predicting uh, whether a person should be granted bail or not so nlp machine can be any ml or deep learning model so main concern is like existing nlp or any any ml models are not robust towards adversaries so if someone intentionally try to modify some things then the outcome will be changed and this may create a huge impact on judgment quota so that's the, our concern So there are several motivation behind working on this problem. For example, legal judgment prediction is a uh, time consuming task. It may take up to several years. So there may be a robust assistant model which can assist the legal, predict, uh, re, uh, legal practitioner for um, fast tracking the judgment process. Also, they are heavily populated countries like India. Millions of cases are being pending. And the backlog of these cases are due to several reasons. Uh, one example is like, uh, mm -hmm. There is a lack of legal uh, lack of legal practitioners, and existing works which are done in face of legal judgment prediction are mainly focusing on heavy language models, but none of them have tried to making a robust model in that area. So for that, we have done experiment. We use two models like BERT and Roberta, which are being heavily used for making legal judgment prediction, and we try to attack them adversarially. So we are using a IMDB data set for adversarial attack. So we took 20 examples and uh, uh, we fed uh, to the both of the models and these were the adversarial examples. So initially original accuracy of these models were around 90% but after adversarial attack the accuracy decreased to around 50 to 60%. So uh, and the text length was around 200 and perturbation was below 5%. So this motivates us around the use of adversarial training type of thing for making a robust model in case of legal judgment prediction. So there are some related works in, done in this area. Uh, I have divided them into two categories for in, in form of uh, models and other in form of data sets. So there are some uh, deep learning models introduced by some authors like uh, by GRU based attention models. And some authors introduce case summarization models like uh, which is quite similar to legal text summarization task. And there are some works done in form of few short learning like uh, hierarchical matching network is a crime classification model introduced by some authors. And there are some pre-trained models also available like legal BERT is a pre-trained model and case law BERT is also a pre-trained model. In terms of data set, there are several uh, existing data set available like Scottus and Laser are data set of uh, American domain and uh, ECHR is a data set of European domain. There are some other data set like uh, of non-English domain like Chinese data set for crime classification. So. I can formulate this problem statement as let's say we have a legal data set where L is denoting legal data set and X1, X2 are the legal text corresponding to that. These texts are of very large length and uh, le let's say the label corresponding are maybe multi-class or binary classification. So the task is to make a model which can even work on large length documents as well as uh, if someone intentionally or by mistake perturb the text, let's say X dash is the perturbed text, then model should also perform well in case of perturbed text. So method we have used uh, for making a robust model, we have used uh, a custom adversarial training algorithm, which I will introduce later. And for handling large text, uh, we have used HBERT architecture, which is quite similar to hierarchical implementation of uh, transformers. And we used uh, uh, this we use our architecture for comparing existing uh, architectures. For that, we have used three approaches for training. Like uh, first of all, we fine tune the models on all our data set. Then after we train using data augmentation. And in third approach, we use adversarial training uh, because adversarial training is quite similar to the data augmentation approach in which we are augmenting the adversarial example. So using these three approach, uh, we are comparing all models. And at the end of uh, all approach, we are using uh, some adversarial example to attack the models for checking the of these models. 
so basically as we know legal judgment prediction is a critical task so a small mistake by a model may create a huge impact that's why model should be robust in that case so that's what we are using our uh, adversarial training and as recent we know that uh, most of the deep learning and deep learning model are not robust to us adversarial attack so basically two step for uh, uh, adversarial training as you can see in diagram first of all we uh, train our model using uh, uh, original example which is known as clean training then after we used to generate some adversarial example using uh, original examples and then after we train mod, uh, model using augmenting this example with original example so this is the basic process of uh, adversarial training for generating adversarial example in case of nlp it is quite difficult because in case of text uh, in case of images data is continuous so gradient based model gradient based mechanism may work in that case but in nlp data is discrete so gradient based method may not work for generating adversarial examples so there are three steps like uh, first of all we rank the words uh, according to importance then after we substitute i will explain all these step later and then uh, then we filter the bad words of our choice so for generating adversarial example uh, we follow the approach like uh, research approaches are being followed in case of nlp first of all we used to find importance of score of each word why this approach is following because it has been observed that most of the deep learning or bert models used to focus only few words for getting prediction of the sentence so that's why we are finding some important score for each word then after we sort the words according to their importance after that we try to find the synonyms regarding that important words so finding synonym we are using a counterfeited word embedding which is basically a special type of curated word vectors they made for finding synonyms of a word then after we are replacing the words with their synonyms and uh, uh, checking uh, the score of the predict uh, per term sentence which or in, with original sentence and for finding embedding for the sentence we are using universal sentence encoder so using this we are use, um, and here step 2 and 3 can be considered as perturbation generated generator function which i will explain later so uh, for finding importance of a word there are several mechanisms but we are using a deletion based approach for finding importance deletion based approach is like uh, we, at each time instance we used to delete a word from the sentence and we try to find difference between prediction before that deletion and after the deletion this will give us the importance score of that word so this is the overall uh, uh, adversarial example generation algorithm in which uh, let's say input is uh, the legal model and we have our text uh, Uh, which has word word w1 to wn and the generator is uh, uh, as i explained earlier this is the generator which is um, i am denoting as perturbation generator which will replace a word with its uh, uh, synonym so output will be a adversarial example so first of all we will calculate the importance of score of each word then after we rank the words according to their importance and then we initialize uh, the uh, x dash is the um, uh, initial uh, word uh, sentence uh, which is basically similar to our original sentence then after uh, first we take the most important word and we um, perturb uh, regarding the uh, that word we put the synonym and then after we check if after perturbing the output is being changed or not if output is in, uh, is not similar to original output then we will find the similarity between perturb sentence and original sentence if it is above some threshold then we will consider it add as a perturb example so we are here we are using a threshold as 0.7 so these are the basic loss function which i have used so for natural training we have used the natural loss function which is cross entropy loss function where theta is the parameter of the model and x is the example and let's say we have our adversarial example generator which is a so for adversarial training we have lad we is denoting our adversarial loss so overall we have to minimize both loss that is the sum of adversarial and natural loss here gamma is denoting our uh, hyperparameter by default we put gamma equal to 1 so which is giving importance to adversarial uh, uh, loss the more the value of gamma more importance will be given to uh, adversarial loss so this is our adversarial training algorithm in which uh, uh, we are taking natural data set which is the original data set and our adversarial example generator first of all we randomly initialize our model uh, maybe we can take a fine tuned model also then after for some epoch we are training the model uh, with the using the equation which i have so first equation 2 then after uh, uh, natural training we use adversarial training for adversarial training we used to generate some adversarial example this depend on the thought like we can 
take the percentage, for example, we can take this percent or maybe we can take a fixed number of examples. For example, we can take thousand examples for adversarial examples. And then after we augmenting this adversarial example with original one. And finally, we training the model uh, on the uh, new data set, which is basically augmentation of original adult facility. So for uh, this was for handling uh, robustness and for handling large we are using it, but which is quite similar to hierarchical implementation of uh, transfer architecture, which are being used uh, earlier in several papers. So for that, we have uh, we divided the text in form of 510 tokens so that uh, because text length is quite large. So uh, we divided token uh, text in the 510 tokens so that two consecutive chunks have 100 tokens in common. And then after for each chunk, we are taking CLS embedding and we have fit to a CNN layer, then after max pooling. And after that, we are using a bide directional LSTM for that, which gives uh, we further part to a dense layer. So this is the overall architecture for us. So for encoder, we are using here adversarial training, which I have uh, explained earlier, and the text are in form of chunks. So each chunk is, pa each chunk is passed through C uh, encoder, which is giving us a CLS embedding. And then after, uh, convolution and by LSTM. Actually, this motivation is taken from CLSTM paper, which is they are using convolution plus LSTM architecture. That's why we have using uh, this in this in our approach. So for experiment, we have taken three data set. Uh, one is Scotus, uh, one is ECHR and ILDC. Actually, uh, as you can see, uh, the text length, average text length is quite high uh, on all these data sets. So for ECHR is a Euro data set of European Council of Human Rights. We, we have taken, uh, actually, um, it contains uh, 66 article violation, but we have considered a binary uh, representation of this data set. For uh, training, it is 7,100 7, cases. For validation, uh, more than 1,300 cases. And for test, it is around 3,000 cases. So for the training set and validation set come from the cases from 1959 to 2013. And for test set, the cases come from 2014 to 2013. Similarly, ILDC is a data set of Supreme Court of India, which contain cases from 1947 to 2020. And uh, uh, this is basically uh, for um, uh, whether a petition is accepted or not. This is a uh, binary classification data set. And approximate 32,000 cases are for training. Uh, and similarly, Scottus is a data set of Supreme Court of India, which uh, so, so US Supreme Court, which uh, it is splitted into 5K, uh, 1.4, and 1.4. So this is the average take length of all the data sets. As you can see, the average take length is quite high, which is more than 1.5K. So result and analysis. This is a snapshot which uh, we take from the uh, output of our model, which is uh, uh, example from uh, ILDC data set. So initially uh, the label was corresponding to uh, label corresponding to this text was accepted. So the green words which are shown here are the original word. And when, uh, when we did adversarial perturbation type of thing, then the label changed to rejected. So as you can see, words are quite similar to original one. So your high court is uh, uh, replaced with higher course and uh, Justified is replaced with reasoned and uh, rejecting is replaced with denied. So these are some changes which uh, done by our perturbation model. And this is not a full text. We are taken on the slab sort. So dot 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 is showing the text in between them. And we are only showing the text which is a perturb because the length was quite high. So as you can see, after normal training, the accuracy of this model was uh, uh, our uh, hierarchical implementation was quite uh, similar to uh, quite uh, better than uh, other models, which are uh, BERT, LegalBERT, and Roberta. For all these three models, we have taken only last five, 10 tokens for training because it has been seen that uh, most of the important things in the legal documents are written at the end of the document. So, but uh, uh, HBERT is performing better. Why? Because it is considering whole text in form of chunks. Yes, yes. Uh, because ECHR uh, legal but is mainly legal but and is uh, legal but is mainly trained on uh, American and uh, European data set domain. That's why uh, the performance of legal but is better in that case. And uh, you can see performance of legal but is not better in ILDC because the same reason because it is trained on only European and uh, American data sets. 
and uh, yes, it is similar, but uh, uh, and uh, for HBOT, we are using Roberta, which is not uh, uh, pre trained on uh, uh, European data set. That's why the accuracy is not uh, uh, much uh, greater as compared to. Uh, Do you do any statistical significant test comparing? Uh, uh, the question is about that. So I have used uh, no any statistical signals. I don't know what you are asking. Okay. There is the test where yes. you see that when there is, I mean, uh, I mean numeric difference between two, I mean, results produced yes. by two methods. See whether the difference is only numerical or is, is the difference also I mean, statistically significant. Like there is, I mean, uh, test or still. No, so you have not done. No, no, I have not done. So uh, after adversarial attacking these models, uh, uh, the performance of these models decreased uh, um, drastically, as you can see. Initially, accuracy was around eighty-one, but here accuracy is around thirty-three percent. And here also, our model is performing a little bit better because it is considering whole text in form of chunks, but all other models are taking only last five ten tokens. So. After, data, uh, we, after that, we trained using data augmentation. And uh, in this approach, it is a little bit better as compared to uh, uh, adversarial attack using uh, uh, normal training. Because in data augmentation, model may come across some diverse set of words which are not uh, uh, during normal training. So after that, we applied adversarial training. And uh, the accuracy is uh, similar to uh, original accuracy. Uh, this is the original accuracy. And after adversarial training, accuracy is a little bit similar because uh, it is not adding uh, much information during adversarial training. That's why I think it is similar. And as you can see, in case of ILDC, accuracy of legal BERT is not uh, uh, as compared to uh, uh, robot architecture. Why? Because it is pre trained on uh, European and American data sets. So, after that, we attacked uh, uh, our adversary train model, uh, and we can see the accuracy is uh, two times better as compared to normal uh, models because these models are trained uh, uh, adversarially. That they are, that's why they are able to handle uh, adversarial attack here. So, yeah, so the conclusion is like uh, we used uh, state of the art models and uh, try to find uh, whether they are robust or not. So we found that the existing model like bot or robot are not robust by using some adversarial attack. And uh, we propose uh, some adversarial training mechanism for that. And uh, for handling test, we are used at an H bot. So for future work, we can see that there should be some explainability added to a legal judgment prediction task. But uh, as of now, Lime and other models are not good for explainability uh, for large length documents. And accuracy reported by us is also still not better. So there is a lot more difference between uh, expert level accuracy and our accuracy. So there should be some work done in that direction also. And uh, most of the work are done till now in the English oriented data set. So there should be some work in non English data set also. So, this is. so thank you. Thank you, Rohit, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, we already had some questions. Yes. You can use this. My name is Subham. Uh, you shown in the slide like a screenshot of perturbation. Ah. So you change the result, uh, but I'm not sure. Yeah, this one. So you change the rejecting to denying, but your uh, prediction is changed. How it can be? Uh, they are both are similar. Actually, uh, I told earlier, like um, in most of the cases, BERT or uh, other NLP models used to focus on few words for their prediction. Mm -hmm. So if someone tried to intentionally perturb that word with their synonym or different type of words, then the uh, prediction may change by the model. But results, results should not change. Uh, no, result will be changed by the, the uh, BERT models. So, so it could be if, like, I can change X, Y, Z, then result should be changed. Uh, if you change a, a word with some similar word or mm -hmm. different type of word, then result may change because those are the important words in that case. No, so, I'm not convinced. Like you said, like you change a similar word. Okay, yes, that yes. result is changed. Yes. So if it is, I change any of the word. No, no, so it, it does, is most important word. Uh, the most important word change with the random word. Uh, 
So uh, result will change or not? Yes, result will change, but we should not change with random words. Why? Because there is a semantic similarity between the original and the perturbed. So we have to uh, maintain the semantic cell, uh, semantic similarity too. Because, uh, Did you get also uh, experiment like uh, change the opposite word? Uh, you can change opposite, but uh, you can change oppo with opposite word. Then also level will change. Why? Mm -hmm. Because but also we have to consider semantic similarity between the perturbed word, uh, perturbed sentence and original sentence. So mm -hmm. we have to modify with uh, the similar words, not with uh, uh, opposite word. Yes, Lekin, uh, but a person can easily understand by uh, uh, reading the documents. Yes. Uh, yes, w one can change meaningful word with adversarial words. Uh, yes, uh, opposite word, but a, a, a normal person can see the uh, sentence and uh, we, he can find that the words are uh, not uh, uh, exact to original words. So the uh, adversary, adversarial attack is like we have to change word with the similar words, not with opposite word. So if someone change with uh, opposite word, then it can easily be identified by a sim uh, normal person. But if we change with similar word, then it cannot be identified. Yes, it should not be called by a human. Uh... Maybe we can have one last question, then we will uh, move on. Yeah. Uh, my question is uh, to you, very specific. You have talked about the architecture and everything, but mm -hmm. as belonging from the field of law, I want to know exactly what is the nature of the input and what we are getting out as an output. Usually, uh, nature of the input is NLP uh, examples. So, as no, no, in terms of law, what kind of legal data are you feeding? We are feeding judgment prediction uh, for finding judgment prediction. Let's say. What do you mean by judgment prediction? Let's here? say uh, a person should be granted bail or not. So the data set is regarding that, or maybe a petition should be accepted or not. So a person is feeding data for. Uh, that and our label is zero or one. Zero is denoting uh, uh, petition should not. What is that data? What is that data exactly? Are are you talking about judgments or the law files or the petitions? What exactly are you feeding? It is the judgment files uh, which we get from a uh, Supreme Court uh, for Indian data set ILDC. It is a uh, judgment file for Supreme Court of India, and it is basically made for uh, predicting whether a petition should be accepted or not. Okay. okay. Thank you. So thank you very much, Rohit. Uh, let's, uh, I mean, thank the speaker with a round of applause. So the next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Ganeshan from IBM Research. Uh, hope it's clear. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, just to introduce myself again, uh, my name is Balaji, I'm from IBM Research. So um, I, I think like um, uh, there was a question in the previous uh, talk, like uh, how 
uh, this work is relevant for uh, the legal fraternity. So I will start from there. So what we are trying to do in this work is help a lawyer or a lay person to file a case. So that's our motivation. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, like getting legal records has its own, uh, like the length of uh, the judici judicial process, uh, let it be as it is. But right now we are focusing on one particular problem of how a lay person or a new lawyer can file a case and how can we make it uh, easier to get a verdict in their favor by giving them like say precedent. Like say, for example, if I have a case and I want to like identify what law points have already been settled, and uh, I mean, can I just cite those judgments to say that these points have already been settled and we are arguing on these points and hence uh, like this is the like kind of uh, whatever the uh, request that the lawyer is making. So, uh, sorry. Could you just move All right, so um, uh, I mean, of course, like just to give an example of what we are talking about, uh, this is a sample of a judgment. This is actually a famous uh, Eastern Book Company case. Uh, I mean, a lot of, uh, especially for students, like uh, are you allowed to copy or take a photocopy of a textbook? So this case settled it. So you are actually allowed. So uh, I mean, the cases typically look like this that you have there are a lot of these entities uh, the uh, who is the person who is filing this who the case is against the petitioner and the uh, person responding to it there are few things like where is this case being heard uh, like few other things like uh, case number those kind of things so the first task in all this was to identify what to extract from a document before we can do anything about this right so uh, we took a particular section of documents which are IPR cases. We didn't want to stretch ourselves, uh, partly because one of the co-authors, he works in this space. So we took like uh, a Supreme Court judgments which are already like sort of marked as IPR related. And we started by constructing a uh, knowledge graph out of it. And we wanted to identify the entities, relations, and also like, uh, I mean, also kind of try to create a knowledge graph or uh, there are two kinds of graphs we will talk. One is a knowledge graph, which is a heterogeneous graph. Then later on, we constructed a graph of, say, all the cases. So the citation link prediction is a, like a well-known problem where a case uh, or a judgment cites some other judgment. But a, dot, a data set on which cases are similar to each other, that's not that easily available. So we focused on the second problem of how do we find similar cases. For that, we can, uh, constructed another graph, which is a homogeneous graph where all the nodes are cases. Okay, so this is the first process. Like as I just said, uh, we kind of created, we started with a knowledge graph. Eventually we have a formal ontology as an OWL file as well. So these are some of the high level concepts that we identified. And we some of them we identified using LDA. Uh, I mean, eventually, like uh, at some point, we have to automate this. So these are the concepts that concepts and relationships that we identified. Now, our graph it is not too big. Like we have about uh, 2,500 hour documents. Uh, these are the sentences, triples. Of course, this is admittedly a smaller graph, but uh, I think like it gives a good sample of the cases. Now, uh, as I said, like there are two. Uh, problems that we focused on. One is the citation link prediction just to show uh, how our graph, how our model performs with the baseline and a new task, which is uh, case similarity. Now, in, the, in this case, like the difference between citation link prediction and the case similarity is roughly like it's still link prediction. We are simply saying that uh, beyond a threshold, two cases are similar. So we let the same GNN model predict uh, just like in link prediction. Now. So the, one of the things that uh, we got like early on uh, because of the involvement of the law faculty here, like how do cases are considered similar? Like, so if you uh, happen to talk to a, like a person who is like uh, well familiar with how the judgments are decided, how the, I mean, these are actually practicing Supreme Court lawyers as well. So 
uh, I mean, they kind of came up with this idea that we need to have, like, identify what are the key law points in a case so that, like, I mean, we can say whether these law points have been settled or is, are they codified in law? What are the points that are unsettled that need to be argued? So, they, especially, like, they kind of gave us this, like, sort of this is manually annotated. We, in fact, like, we now also have a tool uh, where legal students are helping us identify uh, like what are the legal points in a case. So we started off with these annotations. Now, our first, like, I mean, um, uh, just to uh, kind of formally state this, we use uh, an RGCN model. We take uh, two, uh, two problems. One is citation link prediction. The other one is the case similarity prediction. And uh, besides, like say, uh, I mean, the usual features that I talked about, like uh, who is the uh, like plea, uh, who is the respondent, who is the court, uh, who is the judge. Besides those, po those points, we also had some hand curated features, which we call as law points. And in this case, like we started, this is the first set of experiments we did. And we can clearly see that including the 14 law points, the 14 law points are, you can think of these as uh, one hot encoding, although we eventually use ordinal encoding. The question is like, is this case about one of these law points? You can think of uh, initially like that. So including these law points clearly shows an improvement. So basically the, uh, the presence or absence of these legal points has an effect on the judgment. Now, All right. So, uh, I mean, after like uh, after we had done this, uh, we can sort of revisited this like uh, uh, recently, uh, and now we are asking the same question: Can we also include instead of simply using our own encoding, either it's one or one not encoding or ordinal encoding? Can we use uh, the BERT embeddings for these features as well? Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, like definitely on the citation link prediction, there is a substantial improvement in performance. But not on the case similarity case. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean there could be multiple reasons. One, uh, I think, like someone in the previous talk also mentioned that legal bird is probably uh, uh, not as uh, like familiar with the Indian legal terms. We are especially hoping to like use in legal bird. That's actually I'm, I'm going to talk about this re later. So if uh, like uh, if Professor Ghosh students are here, I would like to talk about it later. So that's something that we are trying next with another student project. So uh, this is an interesting, like, of course, like, uh, uh, I just left it at legal bird and uh, in legal bird. Uh, I mean, we tried this, like, just before, like, uh, last week or, like, a couple of weeks ago, we tried this with chat GPT. Like, you simply put the, uh, some case, uh, like, just the title of the case, and then ask chat GPT whether can you predict similar cases. So for the majority of the cases which are popular and for which a lot of, uh, like say, uh, examples exist online, a chat GPT is uh, doing pretty well, right? But again, uh, if you go into, like say, cases which are not that popular, uh, which kind of come up in the third or fourth page of a, like a search index, then the cases, do, the results are not that good. And especially like coming back to our motivation, like say, Imagine that I am a lawyer. The case I am working with is not going to make news, right? So I'm just trying to get uh, a, a case file maybe for my client, and I want to know the similar cases. So the circumstances of these long tail may not be solved just by using brute force large language models. We still feel the, uh, the use of these kind of handcrafted features might still be needed, and also the uh, the graph itself, a legal knowledge graph, if it's publicly available, that also could be useful. Now, just to present this in context, there are tools which provide similar cases. Like there are there are tools like uh, Case Mine or uh, SEC Online, uh, which are like subscription based. And one of the motivations for this project is to kind of create a open source, free to use project. Uh, predominantly using openly available uh, code judgments. So in that sense, I think these results are still useful. So we also have created some sort of a tool which uh, like people are using. So in this case, like this kind of shows 
uh, some of the cases that are like say predicted as similar and uh, in this case like i'm just selecting two cases so if you look deeper into this it kind of the model has predicted like uh, these two cases as similar so we also kind of try to see if there is a path from uh, one judgment to another as a way of explanation so we kind of say that okay this judgment cites this other judgment or this judgment is similar to others there is a path you can find out like how judgments are related so uh, i mean like uh, the I, I mean unlike the i mean we don't actually worry too much about the verdict in the case itself our goal is to find out cases that are similar especially similar on the law point now of course like this is like uh, i mean uh, i mean uh, like if if there are uh, questions about like uh, how how like say technically significant is this so this is still an application uh, we want to like uh, kind of make this more democratized make it available but these are some of the things that we want to do next uh, like of course the trying out the illegal bird that's uh, right up there as the first task but there is an interesting uh, new thing where uh, maybe we can think of large language models and knowledge graphs as doing somewhat the similar task right so can we uh, i mean should we still care about creating knowledge graphs or not um, can we just why don't we train models large language models with the legal corpus and if needed we can extract a knowledge graph from the large language models so this project from stanford that you might be familiar with this varun chenai uh, they have kind of shown uh, like how we can extract extract a knowledge graph from one large language model so we are trying something similar on those but the next frontier like this is not just for uh, like this particular legal text analytics this is also some work that i am myself doing in ibm research which is about infusing knowledge into large language models right so there is a paper like uh, all right so i can maybe take a few minutes to just talk about this so there are uh, like few baselines here one is called kelm so this paper try to infuse triples into a language model in this case uh, the t5 model and the idea they used was to convert the triples into uh, a sentence right so i mean it's not just plain uh, uh, x is related to y it's a actual natural language sentence which is generated and it's kind of given to the large language model during training so this model kind of showed that it performs any model the t5 model performs better uh but the drawback here is they are converting triples into sentences which itself can bring its own errors and also like kind of uh, like slightly like sorry correct so uh, what we are trying to do is infuse knowledge into a large language model t5 can be used for any of the downstream task so the pre training task here is the like next token prediction so it's an auto regressive model it predicts the next token so in this case the the t5 model itself is trained on sentences i mean the sentences could come from news uh, corpus or wikipedia all this kind of data and the idea the klm paper introduces is can we kind of introduce a knowledge graph directly so that we don't have to look for large amount of corpora so this kind of has this advantage that you reduce the amount of training time and also the resources needed to train these models so yeah the triples came from wiki data so yeah i i'm just motivating our next work so this is this has been done on the wiki data on the c4 data set in order to train t5 then uh, another paper came which is called skill this uh, obviated the need for generating natural language sentences here instead they showed that you can directly infuse knowledge from triples and the i mean of course uh, the why we are doing this is like kind of motivated here the large language models whether it's legal bird or illegal bird one of the things is like how is it valid like say uh, next year so should we retrain the model so in those cases one of the argument is like if you train the large language models to use a knowledge graph then uh, the model need not be trained again and again we just need to update the knowledge graph as long as the model knows how to use external resources 
uh, I mean, we can kind of, uh, it's more sustainable. So this is like sort of motivates what we are currently doing, which is uh, not focused so and in so much as uh, like a model trained on Indian corpus, which we should do still. But the idea is to extract a knowledge graph and then make sure that the language models can use the knowledge graph extracted. So in this kind of work, as I presented, uh, till now we have kind of shown that the use of a knowledge graph or use of these uh, law points kind of helps with case similarity or the link prediction task. Our next project, which I'm doing with another student of uh, from the same uh, uh, Delhi University, is to kind of try to extract a knowledge graph from uh, a language model. So yeah, uh, let me stop here. Uh, as I said, like these are work mostly done by students. So like if you are if you are interested to with, to work on some problems, you can always talk to me later. Sure. Yeah, okay. Right. So in this work, as I said, uh, we thought, uh, I mean, this is, of course, a debate between the, uh, the graph community and the sort of like semantic web community. So in this case, we did produce a ontology and we do have an OWL file. But uh, I don't think in the next version of the knowledge graph that we are building, I don't think we will generate an ontology, but given a knowledge graph generating that should be possible. But right now we are not focusing on it. What are the evaluation metrics you are going to use? Right, so for the, uh, we, yeah, the downstream task still, uh, the case similarity still remains one of the downstream tasks and also like summarization of, uh, uh, judgments that like those are two downstream tasks that we are focusing on but the knowledge graph itself we will be using metrics similar to the kbp metrics like these are uh, like well known uh, like mostly be uh, about like recall of relations by uh, precision and recall of uh, relations that will be the metric for the knowledge graph so uh, is there any shortest part distances you are going to use why they have not been they... on the graph is it yeah on the knowledge graph if there are similar distances Shortest within the graph, then why can't uh, shortest part distance or? Right. So, uh, uh, mostly because of the, like, as I said, like, uh, our motivation when we started this was to, we started creating a data set because similarity data sets are not available. So, the citation link prediction data sets are probably easier to create, whereas the case similarity ones probably need human annotation. So, if you have enough number of judgments, eventually we can produce. Uh, and a, a large graph, and then we can exploit all these uh, graph algorithms per se. Uh, but right now, uh, like one of the one of the reasons we are actually like creating a new data set with human annotation is to produce this, uh, maybe to facilitate such research later on. Uh, hi, I have a question. Sure. Uh, great presentation. Uh, so you mentioned that you extract the knowledge graph or the relation triples from Supreme Court judgments, right? right. So how do you ensure the factuality or how do you uh, measure the quality of the generated graph? That is my first question. The second is you mentioned uh, you want to explore using LLMs to generate graphs again, right? Right. To, but then as you, as you mentioned recently, there's a huge problem of factuality or uh, hallucination in these models. Right. So how do you counter that if you plan to use it? Yeah, I will answer this in two parts. The first part, if you just create a knowledge graph using traditional AKBC techniques, that we still rely on uh, precision and recall of the relationships. So, uh, I mean, uh, we, also, uh, we, we are also sort of trying to create a baseline with human annotation, like, and then make sure that uh, the generated graph uh, kind of uh, performs well on that human annotated relationship. The second portion that you mentioned on hallucination, can we actually generate a graph from uh, like uh, a language model? That's where actually we feel this uh, legal knowledge graph is still relevant. One of the ways we could do is take a graph that we know, which is of sufficient quality, infuse it into a large language model, and then try to extract a graph out of this, and then compare it with the original graph. Right? So that would tell us whether our method to extract a knowledge graph from a, a large language model is successful or not. I mean, it, this should not be just uh, meant for checking the uh, 
like validity of the knowledge graph. It could also be like for evaluating whether a large language model uh, is factually correct or it has sufficient knowledge to use for downstream tasks. Like, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a more general purpose, like knowledge graphs could be one way to do this. There are other ways people are trying to see how, how much knowledge is present in a model. Thanks. Uh, hi, uh, so I had a couple of questions. One is I wanted to understand the specifics of the law points that you uh, mentioned. So uh, wh what do those law points include? And, uh, you know, uh, I come from a legal background. So uh, what we generally tend to do is we tend to search for two things. One is either uh, there's any similar case. I mean, we primarily use keyword searches. Mm -hmm. uh, what we check for is whether uh, uh, the facts are similar, whether the argument rates are similar and whether the analysis or the final judgment that is given, that is similar or not. So mm -hmm. what, what is your metric of uh, similarity over here then? Right, so uh, I mean, actually the, in this case, when we started with the extraction of these uh, law points, we were not specifically looking for similarity uh, tasks. Instead, we are simply looking at each document and figuring out what needs to be extracted. Right, so we don't, uh, what entities need to be extracted, what relationships need to be extracted. That was the motivation to start with these law points. Uh, at the end of extracting a graph or extracting entities and relationships from a document, uh, judgment, have we extracted all the important points? So that was the first thing that we were doing. But as I showed later on, using these law points as features, uh, kind of helps with the case similarity prediction. It doesn't mean that the model has understood these two cases are related on uh, these law points. That's a kind of a intuition or a like explanation that an expert has to give. But the model, if we are simply feeding these law points as features, then it's performing better on the case similarity task. But eventually we will have to have uh, either, I mean, this could be a, this is something that we are also exploring as a, a neurosymbolic problem where can we come up with a, like, a reasoning, chain of reasoning, why this case was decided, these are the law points, uh, but that's still work in progress. So how, the human cannot explain why two judgment, I mean, the model cannot right now sh show why these two judgments are similar, uh, but uh, eventually we hope to have a neurosymbolic solution for that. Mm -hmm. So my question was, uh, uh, I mean, so what specific law points are also uh, you're using? So are you categorizing judgments on the basis of facts? And then uh, uh, sort of one law point is with respect to the factual situation. The other law point is with respect to the arguments raised. And Yeah, I, I mean, actually, like, uh, yeah, obviously, like, uh, I'm not the law expert here. So my understanding is, like, it's not on the facts of the case. This is more on the, uh, uh, like, as you say, like, the, what are the law points which are on which cases are settled in general. Like, so for example, like in this case, like what are the like topics like patent infringement? Th is this case on patent infringement? Then we look for similar cases which have, uh, which are also on this particular topic of infringement, right? So this is more at the, uh, like more at the conceptual level rather than the, uh, we don't try to uh, extract too much from the single judgment. Okay. Uh, also, you mentioned something about uh, citation prediction. Right. So, uh, just to clarify, citation by citation predictions, you are uh, uh, predicting whether uh, any other case law or any other uh, uh, statute has been referred to in that particular judgment. Correct. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, citation okay. prediction is a interesting topic for computer science because there are lots of uh, 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 like data sets on citation prediction from uh, papers. Mm -hmm. So, a paper cites another paper. So, that problem kind of. Uh, easily mm -hmm. transfers to judgment. So that's why we tried it. I'm not sure, like, yeah, I mean, it's just a hyperlink in, uh, say, uh, Indian Kanun or somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just wanted to use this uh, link prediction as a sanity check so that we can uh, see whether the case similarity performance is good. Mm -hmm. okay, okay. Uh, and also, uh, there's one more thing. You had mentioned you used uh, Indian Kanun and case, case mine, mine in order to sort of uh, compare the similarity. Correct. Or not. So, uh, both of them use a different type of search engine, right? So Indian right. Kano is more keyword based and uh, case mine is more uh, So uh, the case similarity ground truth comes from uh, case mine. So like if you go to case mine on the, on each case, there are a list of similar cases. So we could do more. Right now we are simply using uh, GNN, ROC, AUC to say whether 
to uh, whether the cases are similar. We could also use a uh, search ranking based MRR kind of thing where we find one case and list the uh, all related cases and we can report MRR. Uh, those are things which we still need to do. Thank you. Yes, uh, we use a subset of only IPR related cases from the Supreme Court and few uh, high courts. In the knowledge graph. Uh, 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 all the cases that are available on the Supreme Court website we have included. Uh, so, no, we, I, I'm, I'm sure the student might know, but I'm not familiar what is the start date. We pretty much used all the cases that are available on the Supreme Court website. Um, the ones which are IPR related. Yeah. We so, took so, so in the interest of time, yeah, we yeah, have to start, uh, I mean, so we stop right now. That's why we have this interactive session tomorrow where the pending questions can be asked. And there is one online question like, is the knowledge graph of only I mean, two levels or is it a plan to extend it to deeper levels? There's a question coming uh, right. asked by someone. So, uh, I mean, I'm not will sure. The, will the knowledge graph only be off, I believe, two levels or will it be deeper? Um, okay, I'm not sure whether I fully understand what we mean by two levels. So, uh, I mean, it's a heterogeneous graph of like, uh, I mean, we, we can check like uh, uh, what is the longest path. I'm sure it's much deeper than two. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, we don't restrict the the depth of the graph, no. Okay, thank you very much. Let's, uh, I mean, thank the speaker. Thank, thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Sure. So the next talk will be by Anmol and yeah, Anmol et al. Et and all. So since it's a short paper, please I mean restrict yeah. it to max fifteen minutes. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so hi everyone. Yep, so hi, I think uh, the last two papers that we saw were more on the neural side of things. And uh, this is where we, um, this is more of a investigative paper where we were trying to understand how the Indian judiciary works, right? Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, we, we've been exploring some questions on Indian Supreme Court data, right? And uh, we stumbled upon this uh, curious case of delayed recognition which has mostly been studied in uh, academic settings, more in uh, you, the research papers that you publish, right? And uh, it, it sort of is very analogous to how uh, case law countries also work, common law countries work, right? Where a judge has uh, cites a previous precedent and he's sort of uh, bound by that in, in some sense. So we started this investigative uh, study. This is a short paper where we are just trying to today present some initial findings in this direction. and. I let uh, one step over first and then you can go next. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, one term you will see commonly used across literature uh, in academia is a sleeping beauty. It's going to be a paper whose significance is not realized for, say, 10, 20, 30, even more years. And they're considered to be ahead of their time. So, uh, as you know, there's this concept of citing papers like related works or influencing works. And if a paper is not, say, cited for a long time, and then suddenly there's a burst in citations, like you'll see along this graph, that's called a sleeping beauty, because it's an influential paper that, which has not been realized for a while. Uh, we're trying to uh, study this analogous concept of sleeping beauties in uh, Indian case law. So uh, what we do is uh, we plot the charts or all the case citations received by, say, a signal judgment or pronouncement since its inception to the present day. And we try to look for the cases which didn't receive a lot of attention for a while. And then the attention span that they got suddenly blew up. And we call them sleeping beauties. Uh, can you go on? Yeah. Okay. So our data set is going to be all the cases that we could find until around the end of 2022 for the Indian Supreme Court. So like 1947 to 2022. And the data we have uh, includes the metadata, which is the year of the judgment, and the bench strength, which is the number of judges which are making the pronouncement. Uh, we'll get to why that is important in a few minutes. Uh, uh, no, go back. Yeah, so we have 54,040 unique Supreme Court of India cases, and we have all the citations uh, which they made and all the citations that were received by them across high courts and tribunals 
and of course across the supreme court itself which is over 1.7 million in number yeah go on okay so the data set uh, if you just uh, take a look at cursory look at the data set itself we'll notice that uh, the average citation received by a single judgment are around 38 but there is a very high variance look at the standard deviation it indicates that there are cases with a lot of citations and those with very few citations and the former make up the slightly large average and uh, if you look at just the courts themselves uh, to see which courts make the most uh, citations of Supreme Court cases, of course, the citations can be law and uh, constitutional uh, articles as well. But right now we're looking at citations of Supreme Court cases. So if you look at uh, all the Supreme Court citations, the Madras HC, the Delhi HC, the Bombay and the Allahabad High Court make the highest, uh, you, you can call them uh, vertical precedents, which are uh, so this is a hierarchy in law, right? So when a Supreme Court makes a, a judgment on a certain topic and a high court is citing that, it is done in an authoritative manner because the Supreme Court has laid out uh, a certain procedure for handling that case. Whereas in the Supreme Court, which is also a, a large contributor to the Supreme Court's own citations, the precedent is horizontal because the hierarchy is maintained across the Supreme Court. So while it is a persuasive argument to uh, handle a case uh, in a similar way as to how it was handled before, the Supreme Court can actually defer and amend the interpretation of law, which was used the first time, and make a differing judgment. Uh, we don't really analyze the differing judgments here, but it's noteworthy. Can you go on? Yeah, so uh, we borrowed the mathematical definition of a sleeping beauty from the uh, literature around academia. So what we do is uh, we plot a chart, which is the citations a case receives, uh, and uh, the age of the case. Uh, you'll notice that uh, for a sleeping beauty, it's going to look something like this, where for a while there are just very few citations, and all of a sudden there's this one certain year where the maximum citations are achieved. So what we do is we plot a line from the uh, first year to uh, the citations it achieves in the uh, maximum citations year, and we get a line using that. So we have citations in the year of judgment as the intercept. It could be zero, but it could also be non-zero. And uh, we plot a chart taking from that point to the citations it achieves in the highest citation year. Uh, now we take the difference for every single year between this point, which is where the line would project the case of citations to land and the actual citations it gets. And uh, to form uh, a ratio, which is agnostic of the number of citations received by the case, you also divide it by the citations achieved that year. Of course, the citations could be zero. So we take a max of one in the denominator and we sum these differences, well, the ratio of these differences for all the years, which gives us uh, an idea of how dormant a case was before it was awakened and how high the magnitude of the awakening was. So these ratios tell you uh, how much more significant the citation received at the end were compared to before the awakening. Uh, go on. Okay, now if we uh, take a quick analysis of all the uh, sleeping beauties we identified, we take a uh, look at the coefficient we just described. We call that the beauty coefficient. And uh, we set a threshold on that uh, to check for around 430 sleeping beauties out of the 54,000 cases. And uh, you'll notice that the one, the case with the highest beauty coefficient was cited only five times from 1970 to, 19, uh, to 2020, but it's been cited around 175 times every year since then on an average. Uh, similarly, you'll notice that the sites before being awakened are very low, like the order of 0.2 or 0.89, but the citations after being awakened are like exponentially higher or two or three orders of magnitude higher. And we're trying to analyze what makes these cases significant. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so as, as one said, right, we, uh, the first part of the study was we identified the sleeping beauties based on the definition established in literature. And then we were more uh, looking into a socio jurisprudential question rather than more of a computer scientific perspective to understand uh, why this uh, very anomalous behavior in citations is happening, right? So uh, then we did a, a very simple analysis of what are the laws most frequently cited by these specific special sleeping beauty cases. We can see most of them are very important in the sense that they uh, either deal with the uh, Article 32, Code of Criminal Procedure, Income Tax Act, and so on. And on manual analysis also, we found that uh, a lot of these cases have a tendency to become landmark judgments a few years down the line. Uh, which uh, we also statistically test in the next slides. 
Uh, yeah, so this is again a qualitative analysis. Who are the judges uh, involved in these Sleeping Beauties? And we found this uh, anomalous behavior again, where we see that uh, Justice J.C. Shah, Justice V.R. Krishna here and so on, had the largest share of Sleeping Beauties out of the 430 uh, SBs that we identified. And uh, again, on manual analysis, we found that a lot of these cases were um, were pronounced in the, during the emergency era. And, and right now, the future work that we want to do is trying to uh, establish causal effects of why this, uh, this is happening now. Uh, is, is the socio-political climate or uh, are there other causal effects that might uh, affect this, uh, these citation patterns? Uh, again, so uh, as a uh, qualitative analysis, we started off by trying to uh, draw parallels between legal uh, citations and scientific citations. And as you can probably see, right, uh, scientific citations are very different from how a judge cites a precedent, right? And this analysis was just a step in that direction where we wanted to uh, qualitatively and quantitatively anal analyze uh, whether this behavior is uh, that makes sense or not. And as we can see, a lot of times the legal precedents are governed by extrajudicial factors as well. And uh, as, as part of future work, we want to uh, establish uh, or study more into, uh, uh, again, taking insights from legal practitioners rather than uh, a more computer scientific perspective. We want to understand why these citations are suddenly jumping in, in numbers. So, next slide. Yeah, so uh, this was, as I said, in conclusion, this was an initial investigation into this very curious behavior or uh, less studied uh, behavior of Supreme Court. And uh, as future work, we want to establish uh, why this is happening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this I mean, intriguing analysis. Maybe we'll find out in the near future. Maybe we, maybe we can find out, I mean, right now with the questions coming. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, yeah, we actually welcome your insights into what are your thoughts about this behavior. Yeah, because uh, it's it's really commendable that you guys have picked up this topic because I belong from the legal fraternity and I'm sure nobody's talking about it right now. Nobody. And it's it's very interesting and I am curious to know what is your motivation behind picking such a topic? Uh, so, as I said, right, we, we started uh, working in this legal NLP domain first. Uh, we were doing simple neural models like judgment prediction and so on. But I was personally more motivated by these extrajudicial or uh, non-neural models to understand what's happening in the country, in the judicial framework of the country. What do you think would be the implication of your study, if I may ask? So, I think uh, one of the results that is uh, that we wrote in the paper, right, was uh, the bench, the relationship between the bench strength and the tendency of a case to become a landmark judgment. So, I think it is very useful for legal practitioners if you can identify landmark judgments as soon as they are pronounced, rather than wait for, a, let's say, 10 years down the line. So, I think this is one, one use case, real world use case that we want to aim. It's really commendable. I commend you guys for picking such a wonderful topic. You take it forward. Yeah. Yeah, but we would welcome your uh, legal thoughts into it. I think they might not be available at that point of time in their site. This might not be online. Probably using all the tools available now, probably they are the viewability of those case, cases was more now. That Pro might probably. be the case. Yeah, that is definitely a confounder, right? Yeah, yeah. So th this is 430 cases. This is 430 cases out of 54,000 cases from 1947 till uh, March of last year. Yeah. Yeah. So we can just directly cut off by number of citation. Then also we'll get the same thing, right? It's no. So so again, citations is confounded by the time axis, right? Hmm. As you go every year, you get more citations, or you don't get more citations. So that's why we were. Looking at the temporal axis, the Sleeping Beauty concept was derived in academic settings yeah, just because of uh, it. The distribution is heavy, uh, long tail, right? Yeah. So, anyways, the cases which are at top would, I think, would generally tend to have the behavior that you are saying of the Sleeping Beauty. Have you analyzed that? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we actually differentiated the Sleeping Beauty cases with the most cited cases. And what happens is, so there's this concept in social network theory called preferential attachment. So as soon as you add a node in your graph 
and it gets uh, let's say two three five citations in the first year so the other judges are also tempted to cite it again so we are looking at the other outliers the the underdog so to say so uh, for most cites uh, cited uh, judgment is it like a constant thing so they'll be uh, cited most of the times like constantly or exactly is that exactly. everything so again in our internal analysis we had three types of cases identified one was sleeping beauty which is uh, lying dormant and then suddenly a jump one was anti sleeping beauty as soon as they were pronounced you had a lot of citations and then as time access grows uh, the citation sort of died down and then there is a normal behavior where on average you get five citations every year and that that sort of held by the judge but yeah we we want to do we want to explore, explore it a bit more and uh, we would need your more questions so yeah uh, you had one uh, formula to yeah. measure the sleeping beauty coefficient or something so do you think if the formula changes some other cases may turn out to be the sleeping beauties according to this yeah definitely i think so we use this because this is the most uh, quantitatively robust method to identify sleeping beauties more recently so this is from a 2004 paper Okay. Uh, and more recently, as you look into literature of sleeping beauties, people have started using neural models and uh, keyword extraction based models, what keywords are predictors of this sort of behavior. But we use this because this was the most robust to, uh, as you said, right, the other cases can come into the analysis, but we stuck to this one for uh, our initial analysis. Okay. And uh, something being marked as sleeping beauty as this. Mm -hmm. So there are two different aspects. First thing is they were not cited that much earlier and now they are being cited. So yeah. both the aspects, I, if they can be analyzed well. Exactly. And a yeah, follow-up yeah. thing on the... Yeah. And, and uh, the third dimension that we want to look at is why is this happening? Is, is it because of a single judge that again, like suddenly started citing a 1950 case in 2023? Or is it because of the socio-political events in the country? that this case, this obscure case from 1980s suddenly got a lot of attention. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we have run out of time. Uh, there is only one talk left and let's uh, thank the speakers with a round of applause. Uh, hello, hello everyone. Uh, it's been wonderful to uh, hear the previous presentations. And uh, my name is Sahil. Uh, I'm a student at uh, IIT Madras. Uh, and this presentation uh, that we are going to do is uh, is a collaborative effort from uh, IIT Madras and Triple IIT Hyderabad. So the the basic question that uh, we are going to ask today is that are models trained on Indian legal data are they fair, right? All right. Uh, so to get started, let me share a high level overview of our work, right? So our work is an initial investigation of uh, fairness in the Indian perspective in the legal domain right and in this presentation what we are going to highlight is the propagation of learned algorithmic biases in a bail prediction task for model trained on hindi legal documents so we are stressing on learned algorithmic biases and of course we are not uh, saying anything about the judiciary or uh, any other decision making system right uh, all right so with these uh, disclaimers out of the way uh, let me just give some prior motivation a background about our work so recent NLP research has uh, highlighted very impressive performance of, for assistive technologies. For example, judgment prediction or case summarization or prior case retrieval, right? But then deployment of legal technology without proper evaluation of, of such bias can lead to very unfair and biased outcomes as well as a decreasing public trust in the, the legal system. And of course, it can perpetuate into unfair decision making, right? And with this background, right, uh, an evaluation and investigation of such biases will help us to understand about the historical aspects, so yeah, the historical social disparities, and it will also help us to mitigate anything that comes up in the future, any harms that might uh, comes, come up in the future. All right, so let's move on to the experimentation part. And like any usual, uh, say, data science project, our methodology is uh, consisting of three sections. So you have say preparation of data, uh, training of the model and uh, gathering inferences, right? Let's move on to data preparation. And first I will, uh, let's have a look at the data set. So what we are using is HLDC. Uh, HLDC is uh, Hindi legal documents corpus. Uh, it is a corpus of more than 900,000 uh, 
uh, legal documents uh, in the Hindi language, and it is extracted from UP district courts. So Uttar Pradesh district courts is uh, what is used. And for a given case, uh, we have a lot of attributes. So we have got a case number and which district does that case belong to and judge's opinion, facts and arguments, decision and uh, the sentences, right? And this decision, uh, this attribute is about whether a bail is being granted or not, right? For, for all the other attributes, is the bail being granted to that case or not? And uh, we are only going to use uh, these two columns, so the facts and arguments and the decision, because a model that we are going to train is, is supposed to do of something like, given the facts and arguments, does the model predict the decision, right? So we are only making use of these two columns. And uh, once we have that uh, facts and arguments column, uh, we do some basic pre-processing, say stop words removal, and uh, removing punctuation marks, uh, some basic cleaning using uh, regex 6. And then we have this, right? Uh, so text original is the original text that was there in the facts and arguments section. We've got it cleaned up, but this is the second column and the label, which is just label encoded, right? So if I just have to show a little example, uh, these words that have been boxed in red, right? So these are some stop words in the Hindi language and they've been just uh, removed. And with this uh, nice text that we have, we are going to train a model, right? But then how do we train a model on, on a data that is directly textual, right? Uh, so we generate good features. And what do I mean by good, right? So our project, uh, like the work that we did, uh, we generated seven features for each case. And by those seven features, we have five of them, uh, which are the keywords of a case. And two of them, which uh, denote the category of the crime that the case is associated with. And I'll go through these uh, in fair bit of detail. So we've got to represent a case using keywords, right? This is from where our five words come from, five keywords come from, and extracting the category of crimes. So to represent a case using keywords, we make use of LDA uh, for topic modeling, right? And to extract the category of crimes, we make use of a zero-shot classification pipeline using some existing transformer, which, which I'll just cover in a, in a couple of slides. All right, so how do I represent a case using keywords, right? Uh, LDA. So LDA uh, on a very high level, what it does is uh, it says that a given textual document, it is best described using a group of topics. And each of those topics are in turn best described using a group of keywords. So these are the keywords that uh, we are interested in. So because LDA is a soft clustering approach, right? So all cases that we have, we'll assign it two topics that LDA provides us with rather top two topics. And for each topic, we have 10 keywords, right? So to get the five keywords that we are mentioning, uh, we take three keywords for from the dominant topic that comes up and two keywords from the second dominant topic. So here we have five keywords ready for each case and let's move on to the, the other part to get the category of crimes, right? So this is where the zero shot classification pipeline is what I was mentioning. Uh, so we've got a standard categorization of crimes in India. So if I look at this snippet, right? So we've got all kinds of crimes that uh, that uh, have, we have extracted out of a little Wikipedia page. So it says murder and it says kidnapping and dowry deaths and human trafficking, right? So we use the keywords that we have uh, and feed that into this pipeline and extract the top two crime categories that a case is associated with. And after all this uh, data processing, uh, this is how our a, a sample looks, right? So. One case has got five keywords, keywords one, two, three, four, five, and two themes. So themes as in the category of crimes. And of course the label, right? The label as in bail is either dismissed or bail is granted. All right, so this is just an extension for multiple cases. And once we label and code all these words here, uh, we are ready to fit our model, right? All right, so model training, uh, what do we do is we are training a decision tree classifier but then before training a decision tree classifier, we first identify a subset of cases from the data set uh, using the theme, right? The category of crime. And once we have the theme, once we have the subset, we sample some more cases or other, we filter out some cases which have either a Hindu or a Muslim proper noun. So these proper nouns are from the keywords that, uh, that we just generated. So this is exactly where we are looking into some religion axis of disparity, right? So for each case, we have two themes and a set of keywords, but then we are only going to look at those cases which have uh, a Hindu or a Muslim uh, keyword associated with proper note. 
So for each model, uh, we are going to identify a true label and models predicted label, which is fairly simple. But then we are also going to identify the number of times the model's prediction changes when the proper noun is replaced with another Hindu proper noun. And then similarly for a Muslim proper noun, right? So I'll go through this once again, uh, true label and models predicted label, but then also number of times the model's prediction changes when the proper noun is replaced with another Hindu proper noun and similarly for a Muslim noun. And why are we interested in, to calculate this number of times of changes, right? So the hypothesis is uh, with every aspect kept similar, except that key name, uh, if the model predicts a new label for the case, then the model has strongly associated that name with the change in prediction rate. Right? Uh, in to put it in other words, I'd say that the model makes a change in prediction only because how it perceives that word, right? The word that we just just changed. And just to go it in uh, going slightly more depth, uh, this is if a model changes its predictions from zero, which is bail dismissed, to one, which is bail granted, more for Muslim nouns replaced by Hindu nouns than the other way around, uh, then there exists a bias against Muslim. Uh, and let me go over this uh, once again in a, in a rather simplified version. So if a model changes predictions to bail granted, right? Uh, more often when the name is a Hindu name, then there is a bias in favor of Hindus, right? And if you are saying in favor of Hindus, then it is, we are saying it is against the other group that uh, we are contrasting it against. But then uh, it has to be noted that this bias may be due to the inherent characteristics of the data set because the model has only learned to classify after being trained on the data set, right? Okay. So once the training is done and we have calculated this, so we just have to evaluate how, how fair our, our results are, right? So we are making use of counterfactual uh, fairness frameworks and we are talking of demographic parity, right? So a classifier should predict the same probability of outcome irrespective of the protected attributes, right? And ideally a fair classifier must predict the same outcome irrespective of uh, the, the protected attribute. And to just put it mathematically, the probability of outcome given the value of a protected output uh, should be the same when the value of that protected output has been changed right so this is uh, this is how technically everything should be equal or rather in a very fair world uh, these two values should be equal but then uh, we are talking of a fairness gap right which is which is essentially the same thing that uh, i showed in the last uh, slide is that we have taken an absolute value of the difference and this is sim this simply shows the deviation of a trained classifier away from an ideal demographic parity, right? And these are the results. So for a given crime, we have calculated a fairness gap. And if you just have a look at the values, right? So we can see that theft and dowry have got uh, a high a high value of of the fairness gap, whereas a murder and drugs have got a lower value. So serious kind of I know, serious uh, to be put in quotes, uh, crimes like murder, uh, the fairness gap was minimal and themes like say dowry and theft, uh, they had a significant uh, bias. And just a little deep dive uh, into the results, right? So we are talking of the number of times the model has changed predictions. So say we think we have only taken a set or other subset of the theme, hatya, uh, the murder that had come out. So this was one of the category uh, of crimes, right? So if I just, uh, if I asked you to look at this column, right? The Hindu names column. So this says uh, that for the cases where model predictions are zero, uh, the model switches its predictions to one more often uh, when the proper noun is replaced by a Hindu noun, right? Uh, instead of uh, being a Muslim noun. So this 13 is greater than a uh, nine, right? And that occurs in most of the, the rows here. So this four is greater than a three and this nine is greater than seven. And so, what this uh, shows is that for the theme Hatya, uh, the model has learned that Hindus are more likely to be associated with the label one, right? Which is bail being granted. Uh, this was for one theme. And if I look at some other theme, right? So this is uh, the hedge, which, which is dowry. So again, uh, the Hindu, uh, the Hindu column uh, here is, is, uh, has got a higher count than the Muslim uh, column. But then uh, the predictions, uh, rather, these two columns have been uh, changed, right? So in, in this slide, uh, what, what can be inferred is that the model has learned for this given theme 
that this label zero is more nicely associated with uh, the Hindus, right? So my model says that, uh, or rather this model says that Hindus are not more likely to be bail granted for this theme, the H. And finally, uh, some ethical considerations of our results that I just showed. So these results in no way indicate a bias in the judicial system of India. Uh, we have only uh, showed how algorithms may learn and propagate bias uh, in their predictions, right? And again, uh, the HLDC, uh, that uh, corpus that we use, it is only on uh, UP court cases and it's not a huge generalization over, over the entire system. And also we want to identify sufficient debiasing methods, right? Uh, to apply on Indian legal AI models because we have to ensure that the models in no way show any bias towards any group or citizens because, because models have the potential uh, to offer support in, in decision making. All right. A final conclusion. So this was an initial investigation into bias and fairness uh, for Indian legal data. And we have highlighted preferentially encoded stereotypes uh, that models might pick up in downstream tasks like bail prediction, right? And we are very strongly stressing uh, on the need for ethical considerations and research uh, required in the direction of say, studying Indian legal data and models. Uh, there has to be more in-depth analysis uh, to understand this in a better way. And we're also stressing on the importance of the need of algorithmic approaches to mitigate this bias, which are learned by these models, right? So this will ensure a kind of AI enabled uh, decision model or uh, decision support in, in a fair and effective uh, manner. Yep. So that is the, it from our end. We're very open to questions. Okay, so thank you very much for the wonderful talk. So now it's time for questions. So uh, Sahil, can you please uh, explain a bit on how do you go ahead with the replacement? So uh, any name uh, for one religion that you find, you replace it by the name from another religion. Is that how you do it? Yes, exactly. So if I just look at uh, my data frame snippet, right? So if I look at the third case, uh, right, this one, which is the first keyword is Muhammad, the second is Gova, then uh, all these words. So I will sub I will look at uh, this case is more interesting to me because one of the keyword is a Muslim proper noun. And there would be other uh, cases, right, which will have a Hindu proper noun as well. So okay. for this case, when it is fed to the model, I'll I'll just switch this Muhammad with, with some other Hindu proper noun that, uh, that came up. Uh, as one of those keywords, and then I'll look at the prediction. So this is the way. Do you, how uh, do you also look at some fine-grained rule association? For example, this name, is it mm -hmm. uh, the name of a person who is committing the crime or the name of the person who is the victim of the crime? Uh, well, not yet. So this is directly just from just a, a topic modeling applied on the facts and argument section. And this is not uh, in that level of depth of what does Muhammad signify here? Is it the victim or, or the other party? I see. Okay. Uh, so I have a query here. Which data set you use? Is this available uh, uh, for, for others to experiment? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I could not catch your question. Actually, can you repeat again? Yeah. So which, which data set you use and is this available for others to experiment? Achha, achha. You are asking which data set we are using, right? Yeah. Uh, so we are using HLDC. Uh, HLDC is, uh, is publicly available. Uh, and it has been published as well. So Hindi legal documents corpus, it has been published. Uh, so Anmol was one of the, like the previous speakers, right? So he was in the, in the group that, uh, that put out the HLDC corpus. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. you. Great talk. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, Sachin here. Uh, great talk. Just one very basic question. So why uh, are the proper nouns used as features in first place? Like, because proper nouns can be filtered out like stop words, right? Right. Why are they included in training in the first place? Like, do you think they affect or they are useful in some way? And what if, if we filter them out uh, as, the, as the first step that you showed, simply as stop words? Uh, right. But then uh, when we are talking of counterfactual fairness, right? So we need uh, kind of two uh, contrasting, uh, I, I'm kind of afraid to use the word contrasting, but we need two sets of uh, groups, right? To first uh, look at the results from uh, from one set and then counter that with the results of another set. So this was like this religion access was, was one thing that we thought can be picked up. Uh, does this answer your question? 
yeah but uh, my question was more general so like mm-hmm. what i felt was if you want to make the algorithm fair don't give it the proper nouns uh, in the first place so it will not uh, like it will not get biased so do you uh, think it's the right strategy well i guess uh, we'll have to explore that so i yes i'll just we'll just have to take a look into it i cannot really comment if that would be a very fair or 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 an unfair or free of biases strategy the reason being uh, these words do occur in in sentences right so in this word uh, mohammed has come out of uh, facts and arguments so uh, just uh, dropping them out uh, might we, we might be losing some some actual information that is there right so that is why i say uh, is it'll be ha- have to uh, looked into in a deeper way okay yeah thank you yep yep thank you Yes, Sahil. I just have an observation. Uh, right. I belong from the legal community, and uh, my observation is the data that you are working on is already biased. If, if let's say, let's suppose the data is biased, and it's not hard to fathom that uh, judges in the UP are free from bias. It's if I make a statement, it would be blatantly wrong. So, as humans, these judges are biased, and therefore, if you are training any model on the data that they are producing, that is bound to be biased, right? and they are right. going to perpetuate the same biases which the judiciary has been perpetuating for like last 70 75 years since independence but my query is how can we take out the bias from the already existing data set right right uh, so of course point 1 is the bias may be due to inherent characteristics of the data set that is entirely true but then this question about how to debias it right so this is something that uh, that that we are going to pick up in the future and for now uh, we just have very vague ideas about how this can be done maybe uh, add add an extra kind of layer on top of this which does the exact opposite thing once we have calculated some numbers right so we do not have a very clear way of how to debias how this debias thing is going to happen but then of course uh, efforts are on is what is what i'll say uh, so so just to chime in on on this uh, we are currently exploring debiasing methods we are totally right the data itself is biased right humans are biased inherently but we don't want our neural models to be to propagate the same biases that's why we are doing all that we are doing here right so we are uh, more technical terms we are looking at regularization terms and so on where okay even though the data itself is biased but can you shift the models predictions away from from those bias regions so mm-hmm. but yeah that's uh, part of our future work yeah so i Uh, i think this could be dealt with very easily just by replacing things like okay name of the petitioner name of that by that tags right generally when you do any r kind of stuff you'll replace it and then it would not have that kind of bias i think so sure sure yeah uh, i think similar to what you were saying right uh, don't use identity terms replace it with something yeah. which signifies that whatever meaning it should ideally carry rather yeah. than actually use definitely identity. definitely but but the point is so this study it it could be applied here uh, we are training a decision tree which is a feature based model but now as you probably know uh, neural models language models pre trained on huge amounts of corpora right so we can't debias them at the pre training stage which have been trained on wikipedia legal documents and so on generally the step that is taken is that uh, you would want to anonymize your data mm-hmm. sure yeah 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 that is definitely one strategy and we want to explore yep yeah. yeah there if you lose that information then maybe the organization names mentioned somewhere maybe the place the region that holds some important point towards predicting the judgment so maybe it's a you know uh, category based uh, the anonymization of the document should work so uh, i would just like to add a point here this i am not telling about nlp in the legal domain but in general like it has been well known that you know there is a lot of literature on bias bias of algorithms and fairness so it is well known that just removing some sensitive attributes is not a foolproof way of making an algorithm like a classifier unfair unfair sorry okay. fair because there can be many hidden correlations between sensitive attributes and non sensitive attributes so this has been tried out a lot in say standard classification like not even nlp or legal but standard classification suppose we know that gender is a sensitive attribute just don't have gender in the set of features 
but that does not make models fair because there right. can be correlations. Suppose you have height as a feature. Now height is correlated well with gender, possibly, but then no one will remove height because height is not a sensitive feature. So there can be a lot of hidden correlations between sensitive and non-sensitive attributes. Right, right, that is a very fair point actually. Causation, causation. There have already been recent studies on uh, using causality as a method to study gender bias, but legal data that we also use counterfactual framework, which is again inspired from causal methods, but definitely we can, uh, we want to explore it. Yeah. 